Hello, my name is Mindy Christensen. I'm medical director at the Johns Hopkins Fertility Center as well as director of fertility preservation. Today I'm going to talk to you about fertility preservation for the contemporary cancer patient. I'm going to start out with a number of case presentations. These are actual patients that we've seen in our clinic and are very similar to other patients that you may also um, see in your practice. So the first patient is a married woman. She's a 28-year-old, para-1001, who is diagnosed with rectal cancer. Her treatment will require neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to surgery. Uh, she's married, as I mentioned before, and she very much desires another child. Patient number two is a young single woman who's 24 years old who was newly diagnosed with breast cancer. She has stage two breast cancer and she will require neoadjuvant chemotherapy with cyclophosphamide as soon as possible prior to a planned bilateral mastectomy. Cyclophosphamide is a known agent that's very toxic to the ovaries and to egg supply. She's always wanted children, she's single, but fertility is very important to her. Finally, we have a very young patient, a six-year-old girl who um, had persistent left foot pain and she went to her pediatrician uh, for further evaluation and an MRI was ordered that showed a three centimeter mass. That mass, unfortunately, was a rhabdomyosarcoma and she required cyclophosphamide um, and other agents for chemotherapy prior to radiation. Cyclophosphamide, as I mentioned before, is very damaging to the ovaries. So I've reviewed three patients. Each of these patients have cancer that will harm their fertility in the future, but each one of them had different options that they chose for fertility preservation. Our first patient, the married woman with rectal cancer, chose to cryopreserve embryos prior to her treatment that she'll actually be using soon with us. The single woman with breast cancer chose oocyte cryopreservation. And finally, the young pediatric patient with the sarcoma cryopreserved ovarian tissue prior to her chemotherapy. Fertility preservation is something that's growing more and more in the United States as the option is available. Fertility preservation is the process of saving or preserving reproductive tissue that includes sperm, ovarian tissue, eggs, or ovaries so that the patient can use that tissue in the future to become a biologic parent. Who can benefit from fertility preservation is actually a, a large group of patients. The biggest group that we think of when we consider fertility preservation are those that will face cancer treatment that will be toxic to their fertility. But fertility preservation can also benefit patients with medical conditions that are not cancer, such as lupus that will require gonadotoxic treatment, and patients with conditions that can be harmful to their fertility, such as endometriosis and primary ovarian insufficiency. And finally, we have a large group of patients that are freezing their eggs electively as they're delaying childbearing. So when we look at the number of fertile women who are affected by cancer, which is, I mentioned before, a large group that would benefit from fertility preservation, we're looking at cancer of reproductive age affecting about 10% of women. Um, that's about 100,000 cases each year in the United States. When we look at the Johns Hopkins Fertility Center, the number of patients we're seeing each week, each month, each year is increasing um, exponentially when we're looking at our fertility preservation consultations. We're also seeing a large number of younger patients for fertility preservation under the age of 18. And as you can see, the majority of these younger patients have hematologic malignancies, which generally require more urgent treatment and will help tailor their fertility preservation. These are the primary fertility preservation options that are available today. I'm going to be talking about the top three, embryo cryopreservation, preservation, oocyte cryopreservation preservation or freezing eggs, and finally ovarian tissue cryopreservation. preservation. The other two options that include ovarian suppression with GnRH analogs such as Lupron, um, as well as Uuforopexy, um, are more specialized treatments and a GnRH analog treatment isn't really considered a fertility preservation treatment, but is something that may be protective to fertility. So I'll talk first about embryo cryopreservation. preservation. Freezing embryos is actually very widely established. We've been freezing embryos for many, many years. Um, it does require the patient undergo controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, followed by an egg retrieval to retrieve the eggs. This takes about two to three weeks, depending on when the treatment is started. The embryos are then frozen for future use and then they can be thawed and transferred into the patient or into a gestational carrier.
The success rates for embryo cryopreservation will depend on the age of the woman at the time the embryos are created, but they um, are generally quite high and can be 40% or higher. Good candidates for embryo cryopreservation are patients who have a partner or would be willing to use donor sperm. And also the patient should be able to delay her treatment about two weeks, at least two to three weeks. Those who would not be candidates for freezing embryos for fertility preservation would be those without a partner or that decline donor sperm, patients who cannot delay their treatment two to three weeks to harvest eggs, children or minors, or those with moral or religious objections to freezing embryos. The next fertility preservation option I'll discuss is freezing eggs. Freezing eggs is actually technically much more difficult than freezing embryos. That's because the egg is the largest cell in the human body and has the most water. Um, that can cause ice crystals to form that can damage the egg. We've been able to develop a type of freezing called vitrification, which is a flash freezing of the egg that has made freezing eggs much more efficient. As, as such, it's no longer considered experimental as of the year 2012. Good candidates for freezing eggs would be patients who are postmenarchal. That means the patient needs to have already started having menstrual periods, and those that can once again delay their treatment two to three weeks. A patient not a good candidate for freezing eggs would be somebody who cannot delay treatment, such as having to start chemotherapy right away, or someone who's prepubertal. Finally, I'll talk today about ovarian tissue cryopreservation. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation is a newer technology, but it does offer a lot of promise as it enables the long-term storage of a large number of primordial follicles where the eggs are stored. It's still considered experimental. About 100 centers or more worldwide are offering the technology, um, and at least 130 live births to date have been reported. When we look at the fertility preservation options that are available, we discussed embryo freezing, oocyte freezing, freezing, as well as ovarian tissue cryopreservation. But for prepubertal girls, those who have not yet started menarche, the only technology that is available is ovarian tissue cryopreservation. The promise of ovarian tissue cryopreservation relies on the freezing of ovarian, the ovarian cortex where the primordial follicles are stored. These follicles are actually thought to be more cryo-resistant to injury from the freezing process. The way that the ovarian tissue harvesting works is we generally perform a laparoscopy. This can be performed at the time of the chemotherapy port placement for younger children. Uh, we can perform a simple laparoscopy and generally an oophorectomy um, unilaterally is performed to harvest the ovarian tissue. There's also been reports of just harvesting a wedge or a segment of tissue, but in general it's safer for the patient to perform an oophorectomy. Um, in the future, that tissue can be just grafted back into the patient. The live births to date have generally all been from orthotopic um, transplantation or transplanting the tissue back into the pelvis. When we look at ovarian tissue cryopreservation, you can see it's a very young technology. The first transplantation of ovarian tissue took place in 2000. And in 2004, we had the first live birth from ovarian tissue cryopreservation. And then to date, we've had at least 130 live births from freezing ovarian tissue. The advantage of ovarian tissue freezing is that the tissue can be harvested without delay. The patient can have the tissue harvested and then start her treatment for cancer right away. A partner is not required and we can generally piggyback the procedure to the chemotherapy port placement. Today we discussed a number of fertility preservation options including freezing embryos, freezing eggs, and freezing ovarian tissue. These options can help a number of patients, um, primarily those facing cancer treatments as well as those with medical conditions whose treatment can be damaging to the ovaries as well as um, patients who are delaying childbearing. Um, in general, it's important to know that early referral is key, so if there's a patient who may benefit from fertility preservation, they should be referred as soon as possible. I'm happy in the future to answer any questions regarding fertility preservation. Please reach out to us. Thank you.